Today's episode, The Spaceship Proportion Compendium, is going to be a long one, since I am going to try to touch, at least briefly, on every system including some of the more unlikely ones. I will leave out any that are just not grounded in science at all, though if I skip one, do not assume that means I am including it in that category. Also, some we have covered in more detail in other episodes, so for those I will keep it brief and mostly just refer you to those episodes. For those of you new to the channel, if my speech impediment is giving you problems, I encourage you to turn on the closed captions. It takes most folks a little bit of time to adjust to it, though by the end of this video you probably will be as again this will be a long one. With that in mind, you might also want to grab a snack and a drink. I also want to add that this topic was selected from those submitted by the channel's patrons over at Patreon, and is the first of at least three we will do this way. I only committed to doing three of these this way, but it was a lot of fun working with the first winner, Drew McTighe, who selected the topic for this episode, so I'm considering making this a regular thing. The goal today is not to discuss basic rocket science, or view the history of spacecraft, and our interest in existing propulsion methods already in regular use is minimal, but rockets made spaceships possible for one key reason that separates them from two other methods. They provide fast thrust to the ship, but at the cost of devoting virtually all of the ship's takeoff mass to fuel. This is because rockets do not have very high specific impulse. Specific impulse, often called effective exhaust velocity, is the total change to momentum, or speed, delivered to a ship per unit of propellant mass used. A rocket can deliver virtually all of that in mere seconds or minutes, making it great for climbing your way up through an atmosphere and a gravity well. Unfortunately, it means that around 90% of your ship's takeoff mass is rocket fuel, just to get it a couple hundred miles up into space. Alternatively, your car can take you a couple hundred miles off just part of a tank of gas, and a one-ton vehicle usually only has 10 to 20 gallons of gas, or about 60 to 120 pounds, or 30 to 60 kilograms, more or less. Cars take you hundreds of miles while using less than 10% of their mass for fuel. Rockets often do not even get to use 10% of their mass for payload. If they had a higher specific impulse, or power to mass ratio, we could carry up way more double your effective exhaust velocity and a rocket that originally weighed, say, 1,000 tons, 90% fuel and 10% for the rest, suddenly becomes one that is only 70% fuel and 30% for the rest. If you quadrupled that exhaust velocity, your ship that weighed 1,000 tons at launch would now not be 90% fuel, but less than half fuel and more than half for the ship and its cargo. That is important for spaceships because you always want your highest specific impulse or effective exhaust velocity, but most alternatives we have now that can go higher have to provide it at so slow a pace your ship could never take off, which does not mean you could not use it once you got up into space to go further, but our ideal spaceship drive would have a very high exhaust velocity and also be able to deliver all that thrust quite quickly. We tend to use rocket science as synonymous with very hard things, like brain surgery. This isn't rocket science or brain surgery, or as one of my sergeants used to say, this isn't rocket surgery. But of course, today, we are doing rocket science. And I want to emphasize it isn't as bad as all that. The basic equation is simple, and the really hard part is calculating all the transfer orbits and performance changes of specific fuel and rockets. We will not be looking at those today and indeed there are lots of nice online calculators you can use to do the grunt work for you. So that was about the only math I plan to bring up, and you do not need to have followed it to follow the basic principle. Some of the systems we will be looking at today provide way higher exhaust velocities but take longer to do it. Others provide higher velocities and just as fast as a chemical rocket. Now I have been asked to cover the EM drive or M drive many times recently, so I will get to that at the end so I can give it a little bit more time, but I want to warn people in advance that I am not going to be pronouncing it a working or non-working system, I am just going to be filling in some explanation of the terms and concepts involved 
so folks know what all this Q cavity this and reaction drive that stuff is talking about. This is a broad survey of mechanisms for space propulsion, some of which we have already covered in more detail in other episodes, not a focused in look at all of them, let alone a declaration of which is best or impossible. It is also worth mentioning that a spaceship does not have to have a single drive, it might employ multiple types, in particular it might use different methods to take off or land. We have discussed launch assist options like space elevators, orbital rings, skyhooks, mass drivers, launch loops, and space fountains way back at the beginning of the Megastructure series. We have not discussed landing and braking mechanisms much, so I will give a quick overview of those in a minute. If you want to know more about those launch assist mechanisms, you can go back and check out those episodes but in some way form, rockets use a lot of fuel and they used almost all of it getting out of our atmosphere. Getting a team of astronauts to Mars and back home to us uses a lot of fuel and most of that gets used up in the first few minutes getting all of that into orbit. Fuel is also expensive, so anything that lets us get into orbit with less fuel and energy or lets you do the same for ships leaving anywhere is obviously quite handy. Of course once you get to your destination you have to slow down too a problem not helped by how fast you are going while making the journey, and that as you approach the target, if it is massive, you will start picking up speed from its gravity. Good timing can arrange to help reduce your relative speed, but you will always arrive with an awful lot of it. For Earth, that is not too big a deal. Earth has a lot of gravity, but it also has a lot of atmosphere, so we can break our speed off the air, unsurprisingly called aerobraking. What is a big problem for leaving Earth, getting through all that air, is quite handy for getting back down to Earth. If you have a lot of speed, or the place has a thin atmosphere, you can make multiple wide elliptical orbits, passing through the upper atmosphere repeatedly until you slow enough. Even on places without much air this sort of trick can work, as can more conventional concepts like parachutes or hybrids of them called the balut a mix of a balloon and a parachute. Of course you can also use balloons like airbags, as we did when Pathfinder landed on Mars. Trying to slow down after interstellar voyages at relativistic speeds can also be done using equivalents of aerobraking, but in theory you can loop around a solar system using the dust in space and solar wind to slow down. Space is not a vacuum, even in the intergalactic void. But solar systems are much less a vacuum than interstellar space, which is in turn less than intergalactic space. It's not much, but it would help you slow down somewhat without using as much fuel. And of course you need to slow down before reaching your destination or you will smash into it. Though litho braking, ramming into something at high speed to stop, is also a method of landing if your ship is sturdy enough. Generally to save fuel and mass, you can always hit with some speed, and anything that saves fuel and mass is worth doing, assuming you don't overdo it and turn yourself into a pancake. Saving onboard fuel takes us to our next subject, which is reactionless and quasi-reactionless drives. Now you often hear folks say a reactionless drive is impossible, but this is an oversimplification and an incorrect one unless you are careful with your definition. As mentioned, rockets work by spitting out matter in one direction and shoving the ship in the other, conserving momentum in the process. Many of the systems we will look at work the same way, and many others are doing it by hiding the matter that is going in the opposite direction. For instance, when I break using the air during the entry, momentum is all being conserved, but we do not notice it since all that air goes flying away and eventually settles in as heat, with the entire planet being shoved just a little bit. If you jump up in the air, the planet actually does go the other direction, it is just that the planet outmasses you by around a hundred billion trillion, so even though you added just as much momentum to it when you jumped up as it did to you, you move up a couple feet and it in turn moves distances that would make an atom look large. You also do not have to lose your reaction mass in all cases, same as you don't when jumping in the air. 
If I'm standing on ice and bounce a basketball off a wall and catch it, I will be shoved the other way by tossing it, then shoved again when it bounces back and I catch it. You can use tricks like this as a launch assist mechanism when you all kneel something to push things off of, and this would include laser beams. Light has momentum and kinetic energy, indeed that is essentially all it has. So bouncing stuff back and forth, be it basketballs or photons, is an example of a system essentially without propellants, or at least a propellant you can reuse. But you can only get so many bounces before it is not practical anymore, and it still costs energy. But we also have the notion of propellants that just are not internal. I mentioned earlier that one of the problems with rockets is that you need more and more fuel to get to higher speeds because you have to accelerate not just the ship, but the fuel you will be using to accelerate more with later and the fuel you will use to slow down. That is a core problem of any system with an internal propellant. If you are pushing something with a laser generated elsewhere for instance, you do not have to pay all that extra energy to push onboard fuel up to speed too. I will discuss this a bit more when we get to photon rockets. Hybrids of this, where you are carrying a propellant but the energy is coming from outside, like a ship that has solar panels it uses to heat up propellant to plasma temperatures, lets you get a lot more thrust from the same mass. This is the basic concept of a lot of the new propulsion concepts we will look at and the big problem is that external sources like this tend to mean you can go to a higher speed, which is great, but that it takes a long time, which means it is no good for takeoff or landing. Ion drives, electrodynamic tethers, or electric propulsion just does not give you the thrust you need to climb out of a steep gravity well like a planet, particularly when you need to claw your way through several kilometers of air. This is the exact opposite of various nuclear power drives which can often give you all the thrust you need, you just do not want to use them in your own atmosphere. We spent a lot of time in the Interstellar Colonization video talking about Project Orion and Daedalus, which basically operate by propelling a ship by blowing up nukes behind it. That's great in deep space, but not for taking off from Earth. That is not the only nuclear option though. First, you can just use it to power the electrical propulsion drives we will get to momentarily, but you can also use what is called a nuclear thermal rocket, backwards of a thermonuclear bomb. These come in a lot of variations and are devices we have actually built and tested, and essentially you have a fission reactor that you are cooling with some substance, usually liquid hydrogen, then venting the hot hydrogen out the back. Thermal rockets are themselves, nuclear or not, a fairly classic type of propulsion. You externally heat some gas rather than combusting it, or in the case of a cold gas thruster, are just letting something warm up and shift from being a solid or liquid into a gas, no different from putting dry ice in a bottle. In a nuclear thermal rocket, you are just letting fission do the heating. They are decently more efficient than chemical rockets but usually seen as not enough to justify the additional hazards and risks. That is debatable, but nuclear has bad public relation issues, and nuclear thermal rockets are not the safest devices in the world. Same issue for nuclear electric propulsion, and that is just where nuclear is the power source. Electric propulsion is neither new as a concept or a technology. The option was kicked around by Robert Goddard over a century ago. They tend to offer a nice slow thrust that is good for station keeping, and a lot of Russian satellites use this, and it is the basis for concepts like ion drives. One alternative before we get to ion drives, though, is electrodynamic tethering. Way back in the Skyhooks episode, I mentioned this in the comments, annotations, and FAQ as a way to regenerate momentum and altitude on Skyhooks but I skipped including it in the episode because I was trying for shorter episodes then, and it still holds the record for the shortest video on the channel. It is a pretty novel concept though. Objects with powerful magnetic fields, like our planet, can be pushed off of, and while this is not a good approach for takeoff vehicles, it works just fine for things in orbit where they just need a little thrust here and there for station keeping. Lots of thrust is good, 
but often we just want small amounts that use little or no propellant. Which brings us to ion thrusters. These actually come in a lot of types, but the two most well known are HET, the Hall Effect Thruster, and Vasimir, the Variable Specific Impulse Magnetoplasma Rocket, and we will focus on those two. But in a nutshell, you are taking power, whether it is obtained from solar or nuclear power sources, and use that to speed up ions and shoot them out as your propellant. These are almost always very slow systems in terms of their acceleration, so you would use them on things already in orbit, not to get up to orbit. They get up to a higher speed than a chemical rocket, but they take way longer to do it. Let us start with the Hall Effect Thruster. The Hall Effect was discovered by Edwin Hall of John Hopkins University way back in 1879 before we even knew what an electron was, so it is an old tech and designs for using it for spacecraft propulsion go back to the early days of the space race, but the designs were so inefficient it mostly got shelved. Now in a nutshell, a Hall Effect thruster uses a magnetic field to accelerate plasma up to much higher exhaust velocities than chemical rockets produce. It just does this as a thin trickle for days or months instead of seconds or minutes like a rocket thruster. No good for launch, but great for interplanetary work. The preferred fuel is Xenon, which is fairly abundant on Mars, and which we usually get on Earth or Mars by distilling it out of the atmosphere. Xenon is a good fuel because it has a high atomic weight, about 130 times hydrogens, and a low ionizing potential, meaning it is easy to strip off an electron so it will have a charge and respond to the electric field. There's other things you can use but Xenon has numerous advantages. The ionization is achieved by slamming electrons off the Xenon so it knocks free an electron. Vasimir, the Variable Specific Impulse Magnetoplasma rocket, uses radio waves to ionize its propellant and to heat it too. Proposed by Franklin Chang Diaz in 1977, this system does not use an anode, which is good because anodes tend to corrode quickly during use, a problem with many similar types of ion thrusters. It heats the propellant by radio waves, usually xenon again, though most testing is done with argon because it is cheaper. In a nutshell, Vasimir works off concepts developed for nuclear fusion and it heats its plasma to around a million Kelvin and it can launch those particles at speeds of up to 50 kilometers per second, faster than other ion thrust systems. Unfortunately, it also builds up a lot of heat. You could also vary the specific impulse it gives off, which is handy. Vasimir is a very attractive system, but not without its problems, and Robert Zubin of the Mars Society has been critical of the system on several points, and one is power consumption. With both systems, or any of the other variants essentially running on electricity, the question is always where you get your power supply, which mostly comes down to how do you squeeze the most energy out of the least mass. This usually excludes chemical fuels because we could just set them on fire like a classic rocket, and also batteries since we have yet to develop one that can push out as much energy per unit mass as chemical fuels. This leaves us solar power or nuclear power. Ideally a nice compact fusion reactor would be great, and we have talked about fusion a lot in previous episodes, but we do not have that yet. So the question is, what is better, solar or nuclear? The answer is not as obvious as it might sound. In space the sun is always shining, there is no night or clouds. Nuclear reactors produce huge amounts of power from tiny amounts of fuel around a million times what chemical fuels release, but they tend to be massive when you include all the equipment and shielding. For a ground-based reactor, we do not care about mass, so they are quite massive, but you could possibly get reactors potentially generating around a kilowatt per kilogram of reactor, maybe more. In practice, as Zubin pointed out, the largest reactor ever put in space only produced about 10 watts per kilogram. Solar power, on the other hand, in our general region of the Sun, can do a few hundred watts per kilogram with the newest systems. Of course they are also more exposed to damage in space from micrometeors since they are rather large and fragile, 
while a fission reactor is mostly shielding already. Both of these technologies have tons of room for improvement, and it will be interesting to see who wins the race on power to mass ratio. If and when fusion gets made practical, it would probably replace both, but we could easily see both win. After all, solar gets rather ineffective the deeper you go out in space away from the sun, so you might see fission powered ion drives out there and solar nearer in. Ion drives are very promising technology, though especially as we improve our power to mass ratio of both solar and nuclear systems. Now before we get to the M drive, I wanted to cover some other hypothetical high tech drive systems. Quite a few of these we have talked about before in greater depth, for instance we did a whole video on the Alcubierre warp drive in the FTL Faster Than Light series. Similarly, we did a video on using artificial black holes to power starships, so I will just refer you to those if you are interested. In the episode on black hole powered starships, I mentioned that they give similar performance to antimatter but are less prone to explode. Antimatter is often regarded as the ultimate rocket fuel, though of course it is actually a bipropellant fuel, matter and antimatter. Antimatter, when combined with normal matter, turns both of them into raw energy, and you could source your normal matter from the containment system for the antimatter or by sucking in random space gas. As fuel goes, when you have to carry your fuel with you, nothing beats antimatter. The issues with antimatter are twofold, production and containment. It currently takes huge amounts of energy to produce antimatter, orders of magnitude more than it releases, and storing it is a tricky proposition usually assumed to involve keeping it in a magnetic bottle, obviously you cannot keep it in a normal bottle or it would explode when it touched the matter in the bottle. If you had a way to produce antimatter for similar amounts of energy to what is released, and if you could safely store it, then this is the ultimate rocket fuel and allows speeds genuinely close to the speed of light. Other than production and containment, it is the same as any other rocket fuel too, though it is arguably a photon rocket since it is releasing energy as photons. A photon rocket, sometimes jokingly called a flashlight drive, is where you are just emitting photons to push you away. If you drifted away from your spaceship, you could use your flashlight to push you back toward it, same as you could vent some air from your tanks to push you back too. The problem is, it takes a lot of energy to do this and a battery does not have much. Batteries do not store as many joules of energy in them as an equal weight of gasoline for instance, or other rocket fuels. The other problem is they produce virtually no thrust at all. A flashlight, say a 30 watt flashlight, and one that also radiates all that light in the same direction, produces a thrust of its power divided by the speed of light. Conveniently, that would be 30 watts divided by 300 million meters per second, or 1 ten millionth of a newton, 10 to the negative 7 newtons, or 100 nanonewtons, or 0.1 micronewtons. Now if you and your spacesuit have a combined mass of 100 kilograms, F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration, or acceleration equals force divided by mass. 10 to the negative 7th divided by 100 equals 10 to the negative 9th meters per second squared, or a nanometer per second second. Not very fast. If I had been drifting away at a meter per second, it would take me a billion seconds, or a few decades, to bring myself to a relative stop. All the while, I have been drifting further away. Obviously my battery, and oxygen, ran out way before that. But there are two tricks of note for this. First, I don't need any fuel on board, I can just have solar panels drinking in sunlight. Let's say I had a nice thin efficient solar panel of a couple square meters giving me 3000 watts of power out of my bigger flashlight, and the whole thing only weighed a kilogram. 100 times the power as our last example, pushing 100th of the mass, that gives me 10,000 times the acceleration. Now that is not as bad, after a few decades you are not going 1 meter per second but 10 kilometers per second. Some of you might be saying now, hey why even bother with solar panels and flashlight, why not just use a mirror, you could make that even thinner and not even need the flashlight. 
And that is true. Except it's even better since when light hits and reflects off something, you get double the effect. So a very thin mirror, being hit by sunlight, has a much higher acceleration than the flashlight since you can use all that mass as just simple thin mirrors, getting more light, and getting double the push from it. You can also bounce that light at an angle to produce thrust in different directions. But that is not the end of it, because we could bounce more than once. Sort of like our earlier example where we bounced a basketball off the wall then caught it and threw it again, just with light instead. If I have a nice reflective surface, and a laser with a reflective surface around it too, I can shine that laser on the first mirror, which bounces it back to the mirror around the laser, which bounces it back to the first mirror, and so on. A spaceship and some space station bouncing a laser back and forth between them could get that ship up to a pretty good speed if you can keep that beam contained, which of course gets harder and harder the more times it bounces and the further apart they get from scattering and diffusion. Plus, each bounce takes longer. But such a thing as a launch assist system has some possibilities. And we explored laser and light proportion in the interstellar colonization and Nico Dyson beam episodes in more detail. I discussed there the idea of having a laser highway between two solar systems, where you have many stations along the way using fusion to power themselves and bouncing lasers off ships as they passed, possibly back and forth a few times if you can aim and focus the reflected laser well enough. Now if we have the ability to alter either what the physical constants are, like gravity, or make them not work symmetrically, say gravity that emitted like a cone, not a sphere, other options become available. Imagine for the moment that a large and massive object did not emit gravity in all directions but just in one direction, something like a gravity flashlight or laser. We have no idea how to do such things yet, and maybe never will, but it may be possible in the future. Certain hypothetical materials, like negative matter, a type of exotic matter we have discussed before in the Faster Than Light series, could let us achieve such effects or equivalent ones. These sorts of ideas are used for concepts like the diametric drive or pitch or bias drives. These are totally hypothetical craft relying on science we do not have yet, but I feel they deserve a mention. Lastly, we have the idea of picking up fuel en route, gathering up either space gas or dark matter to use as fuel. This is the basic idea of the Bussard ramjet which we discussed in the intercolonization episode, and for how to refuel a black hole powering a ship which we discussed in black hole spaceships. Using dark matter as a potential fuel is something we looked at in the dark matter episode and has to be classified as totally hypothetical since we still do not know the properties of dark matter or any way to manipulate it, but we discussed it more in that episode if you are curious. Okay, on to the M drive at last. I saved this one till the end so we could spend a bit more time on it since it is a big news item with an awful lot of confusing and often contradictory reporting. It hit the news again recently when someone said that NASA would be releasing a peer-reviewed paper on it. At the time of this episode that paper has not been confirmed to be released, let alone released, but the assumption it was being released is what rekindled interest. Now the EM drive, or just M drive, is often called a radio frequency, or RF, resonant cavity thruster. Its sibling device, the Kinet drive, or Q drive, works off the same concept. This is a type of electromagnetic thruster in which electromagnetic radiation, photons, are confined to a microwave cavity, and provides thrust to the cavity in a particular direction as the radiation reflects within the cavity. Now what is a microwave cavity? Well basically a box with mirrors inside that reflects that frequency of radiation, in this case microwaves. You probably have one in your kitchen. A microwave oven is a simple microwave cavity. There are two special notes about this though. First, a terminology one. Whenever we discuss cavities, you will hear people refer to its Q-factor, 
and irritatingly, most do not bother explaining what this mundane thing is, so many folks assume it is some weird physics thingy. A Q factor is just short for quality factor, and it basically measures how good the cavity is at keeping the waves bouncing around inside it rather than dissipating as heat. It isn't quite as simple as just saying that a perfectly reflective meal would have infinite Q, but for basic conceptual purposes it amounts to how good a reflector the cavity is. That's important since as I mentioned back when we were discussing reflecting lasers repeatedly, every time you can get it to bounce you get more thrust imparted. So higher Q is good, and it's also very good to get from a practical standpoint when you are trying to dump tons of power into a cavity. Something with really high Q would make an excellent battery for instance. You could just keep dumping more and more microwaves in and lose very little of it to heat dissipation. Now the other difference is that these kind of cavities are usually cylinders. For the M drive though, it is a tapered cylinder, wider on one side than the other. And the basic notion is that the wider end will get more force exerted on it, generating a net thrust. Now in principle, this device produces thrust but it does not seem to have any sort of propellant, which would make it violate conservation of momentum. Remember, even our laser or solar sail drive uses photons as their propellant. The EM drive is not supposed to be emitting any, just bouncing them around inside. So this drive got dismissed as total nonsense by most until one got built by NASA and seemed to produce some thrust. Now it was not much thrust, so little it might even be noise, and actually less than you would get by shining a flashlight using the same power. Indeed, there is a concern that it is just asymmetrically emitting radiation, again like a flashlight, since it is hardly a nice symmetric sphere. At this point many would say, okay, even if it does produce thrust, it is less than a flashlight or laser, so what good is it? fair point, but it would still be interesting until we knew how it was producing any thrust and the notion is that this device does not necessarily scale its thrust linear to its power, by which I mean if we double the power to it we would expect to get more than double the thrust. So you would next say, why have we not just done that, this experiment was only using around a kilowatt of power, why not throw in 10 kilowatts or 100 and see what happens. The simple answer is that the high Q factor cavities that can also handle tons of power without melting are very, very hard to make, which obviously also means very expensive. Now a few more notes. First, the M drive is not quite the same as the Kinei drive, but the two get used synonymously a lot so you should probably treat them that way when reading about either one, because folks use them interchangeably. Second. It is in no way a warp drive, that was just bad reporting. EagleWorks is NASA's department for looking at novel and sometimes fringe propulsion systems, headed up by Sonny White, so they are always looking at various strange systems and Sonny White also examined the Alcubierre warp drive around then and lots of bad reporting jumbled them together. If you see an article talking about the M drive and warp drive, you can pretty much just skip it. Either the author is using a clickbait title or they didn't do their research, so either way it's probably not worth your time. I get asked for my opinion on the M drive a lot and personally I do not expect it to actually work, or if it does then the thrust will turn out to be something quirky where it is being provided by photons leaving the drive but interfering with each other so we have problems detecting them, or bouncing off quantum vacuum plasma or a Q thruster, where in this case the Q is for quantum not quality. Sonny White tossed that notion out there as an option, but the idea of virtual plasma as a type of virtual particles which we have discussed before is not too popular with theoretical physicists at the moment. Fundamentally, we are at the wait and see stage, nobody has gone and proved the M drive works, that is just sensationalist journalism, but nobody has successfully killed it yet either. I would not suggest holding your breath it will work, but I would say it is still on the table for now. That is true for a lot of the systems we have discussed today, 
and hopefully at least one of those will turn out to be both possible and practical so we can replace chemical rockets. I think we are justified in being optimistic and putting some faith in human ingenuity, but we also want to keep our exuberance dampened and scientific. As I've said before, there is a big difference between proper skepticism and naysaying, as well as just trusting to science as a magic wand. It can often seem like propulsion technology is proceeding at a snail's pace and sensationalist journalism constantly reporting every new theory like it was proven fact can make a person pretty jaded, but we are making good and constant progress. For my part, I am very optimistic about that progress, if properly skeptical too, and while we could only cover the basics here, you should have a good place to continue your own research into these. I'll be placing several links in the episode's description to good places like Project Row to either follow up on these or get more specific data, but this is where we end for today. Some quick announcements. First, I wanted to thank Drew McTighe. He was the first winner of our Patreon subject selection and chose today's topic. We spent a lot of time on the phone discussing what to cover and what to bypass for time constraints, and we worked on the script together which was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to future collaboration with folks on such topics. Next, we have our second winner for a topic. That topic is going to be star lifting, and that winner was Bill Maines. So congratulations to Bill, and that was an excellent topic pick and one I have been considering covering for a while. Star lifting is the term given to various hypothetical processes for lifting matter off of stars, as the name implies. This has quite a few possibilities and uses, the two most obvious being that 99% of the matter in our solar system is in our star, so it creates a source for matter, and secondly, that you can use this process to extend the lifetime of a star. We will look at that and some other awesome things you can do with star lifting when that episode comes out on October 6, 2016. That will be after we take a look at Dark Energy next week, and that will be followed by a look at Cryptocurrency and Blockchain, then get followed by a look at the Kardashev Scale on the 20th. That topic was selected by a poll over on our new Facebook group, Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, which Drew is now a moderator for too. I want to thank everyone who came over and joined that last week, and everyone who volunteered to moderate and administrate it and we will be selecting a lot of our topics by polls conducted over there of topics selected there from now on, as it is a better place to discuss the ideas. This week though, while I'd encourage you to join the Facebook group, we are also launching the identically titled subreddit, Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, so I will be over there after this episode comes out, answering questions, and I hope you will join us on both. We will have one more Patreon topic selection in a few more weeks, so it is not too late to join and submit topic suggestions over there, and indeed I am considering doing it more in the future. You can opt to submit a topic anonymously if you do not want me saying who you were during the videos, but I prefer to be able to say whose idea it was and to be able to sit down on the phone and discuss the idea with the person who submitted it. That won't affect whether or not the topic gets selected but do let me know if you do not want your name used, or want a pen name used, or are not comfortable chatting about the idea on the phone. That third episode will probably come out in early November. Again, next week we will look at Dark Energy, and clear up some of the confusion about this mysterious force that seems to be shoving the universe apart. Until then, you can try out some of the other episodes on the channel or at the website IsaacArthur.net or follow me on Facebook or Twitter or Reddit, and if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to like it and share it with others. Thanks for joining me today, and until next time, have a great day.